May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of oppression and inequities and recognize our current and future contributions of indigenous communities in Denver. With the Outdoor Adventure and Alternative Sports Master Plan, we continue to honor the responsibility to be good stewards of this land and open space. We wanna thank you for joining us. We're honored to have your support, your passions, your questions, your recommendations, and your ideas. A couple of quick notes about the Denver Parks and Recreation System. The city's urban park system encompasses 250 urban parks, five designated natural areas. It also includes 24 lakes, 80,000 trees, more than 80 miles of trails, 35 historically designated parkways, 10 off-leash dog parks, 30 recreation centers, 31 pools, 150 playgrounds, 300 athletic fields, and eight public golf courses. In addition, the Denver Parks Rec and Recreation System is fortunate to include the Denver Mountain Parks. The mountain parks are comprised of 22 accessible mountain parks, 24 conservation areas totaling more than 14,000 acres in Clear Creek and Douglas, Grand and Jefferson County. Our master plan purpose and goal is within the next 20 years, we want to continue to be leaders in outdoor recreation. This master plan builds upon the vision and DPR's game plan for a healthy city to create a strategic framework that diversifies current recreation opportunities by providing new ways to engage with and recreate in the outdoors so that all Denverites can live long, healthy, happy lives. This master plan will provide new and innovative ways to access outdoors and opportunities to recreate an outdoor adventure and alternative sports. Conversations of equity and access are built into the framework of our purpose. We will discuss tonight the inverted L, which highlights various equity priorities in the city. It is our hope throughout this process that together we'll develop a plan to enhance and increase outdoor adventure activities, infrastructure, programs, and partnerships. Our team is comprised of DPR's Executive Director, Happy Haynes, John Martinez, the Deputy Manager of Recreation, myself, Leslie Pickard, Director of Recreation, Molly Lamphere, Senior Health and Recreation Parks Planner, Laura Morales, who focuses on all DPR community engagement, Meredith Wenskowski from Livable Cities, Daryl Watson of the Watson Wenk Group, who, who is also dedicated to that community engagement, Nancy Locke and Carl Burkhart from Stantec, focused on data analysis. We have Jason Genk from Barry Dunn, who's providing a review of all of the peer cities to Denver. With all of this said and all of these introductions, final note, we want to continue to thank you for joining us this evening. You're such an imperative part of this process. We cannot do any of the work that DPR does without you. So at this time, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Meredith. She's going to continue this important conversation. Great. Thanks, Leslie. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to be here and share with you some um, of our, our ideas and the work we've been doing to date. So tonight, what we're going to go over, I'm going to just highlight um, some feedback opportunities and kind of how to um, engage with the, with the Zoom and interface if you haven't done it before. Um, going to go over the plan vision and the, the four areas of focus that we've really been drilling into, um, including equity, programs and activities, um, this idea of progressive programming, which I'll talk more about, um, and access and transportation. Then we will uh, save time for questions and discussion at the end um, and certainly highlight the, the planning process and different ways to engage um, and taking surveys at the end. So with that, I am going to dive into the to the feedback opportunities and, and um, what you guys can expect. So I think you guys all know this. This webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be available after the presentation if you want to go back to it. Um, but just note that it's being recording recorded tonight. Um, but there are no cameras on uh, for any of the participants here. So um, you don't have to worry about that. 
Um, how to interact. So we're going to do some uh, live polling tonight. And as we go through the presentation and you have thoughts to share, please use the chat feature. Um, if you have specific questions that uh, we you'd like us to come back to at the end of the presentation that maybe others um, would love to hear the answer to as well, please use the Q&A button um, and, and, and put your question in there. Everyone will be able to see these. Um, and you can actually actually use a little upvote feature, which is, which is this little thumb um, that you can see. If somebody asks the, a question that you would like to ask to, you can just hit that upvote feature, um, and we will see that on our end to make sure that we um, answer it. And as I mentioned, we will be doing some live polling during the presentation around some of the topics we share. So you'll see it pop up on your screen um, and would love to, to get your feedback from you tonight um, on what we're asking. And we'll also kind of share the, share the responses so, so you will see what others in the meeting um, and how everyone's responding. <clears throat> So with that, um, I'm going to dive in and, and share the vision. And, and Leslie hit on this, but I'm going to just read through this again, as it, it really is a kind of a, a important in our um, vision and kind of background and what we're trying to accomplish here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the Outdoor Adventure and Alternative Sports Master Plan builds upon the vision and Denver's game plan for a healthy city to create a strategic framework that diversifies current recreation opportunities by providing new ways to engage with and recreate in the outdoors so Denverites can live long, healthy, and happy lives. This master plan will provide new and innovative ways to access the outdoors and opportunities to recreate with a focus on providing access in areas with higher obesity and depression rates. So that's really been guiding our work to date. And as, as we've been um, working through this, th these four uh, focus areas or kind of pillars have really emerged as, as the, the big ideas that we'll talk more about tonight. Um, the first one is to enhance the diversity of outdoor adventures in our park system and improve the health and wellness of Denver's residents. So this really goes back to the equity index and the inverted L. Um, providing opportunities for everybody, but again, enhancing that diversity of those that do engage um, in, in outdoor recreation and adventures. Um, secondly, enhance and increase outdoor adventure activities, programs, infrastructure, and partnerships to ensure Denver is a model for outdoor adventure in the Mountain West. You know, DPR does a tremendous amount um, today and through all the programming, and we'll, we'll share some highlights to, tonight. Um, and really what this plan, a part of this plan is how do we improve even more? How do we actually, um, you know, fill in some gaps and enhance what's offered so we truly are seen as that, that model um, for um, a parks and rec system um, and, and the outdoor recreation offerings. Uh, the third is third one is create progressive programming to better engage youth, families, and people of all ages and abilities by creating outdoor recreation recreation opportunities for all levels of experience. This is really about finding opportunities for everyone at every ability. Um, and at all levels of experience. And so we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like if you're an entry level or kind of a, a, a beginner um, to a more experienced person and, and making sure that there are opportunities for everybody along that spectrum. Um, last uh, is improve access and transportation between Denver's urban parks and mountain parks to improve the diversity of experiences. You know, we know that um, access and transportation between the urban parks and mountain parks is challenging today. Um, and, you know, DPR is very much aware of this and working on it. And this is really key to providing experiences for everybody throughout the system. So with that, I wanna share a few things about our first one of enhancing the diversity of outdoor adventures and improving the health and wellness of Denver's residents. And as we look at some of the outdoor participation, participation trends more nationally, this data comes from the Outdoor Foundation. Um, and, and looking more broadly at kind of who engages in outdoor 
uh, recreation. You know, we have uh, predominantly white folks um, engaging in outdoor recreation and, and those of higher income levels. Um, you know, really the goal in, in this plan is, is how we start to diversify that and make sure that we're getting everybody to engage. Um, and, and on the far right here, you can see some, some trends in data that um, the kids ages six to 17 um, are outdoors and they were outdoors in, in 2020 far less than they were in 2012. So really data showing we need to get our, our youngest participants, we need to get our youth out outdoors and really build that um, within them as, as a way of life to improve health and well-being overall. So this plan, um, you know, a, a key part of it is building upon Denver's equity index um, and, and those um, neighborhoods in the inverted L. So in the graphic here, you can see they're kind of that, that red color um, with um, that have been, you know, highlighted as kind of the areas of lower equity. And it's really places where residents face the highest hurdles in leaving healthy lives and looking at everything from income level to different um, opportunities like food and parks, uh, prenatal health healthcare, obesity, um, and, and a variety of different factors. Uh, and so um, as we go through some of our information tonight, you'll see how we are taking this equity as a constant overlay and kind of reminder um, of how we're analyzing some of this stuff um, and will guide um, a lot of these recommendations through this plan. The next one is enhance and increase outdoor adventure activities, programs, infrastructure, and partnerships to ensure Denver is a model for outdoor adventure in the Mountain West. So you, you may wonder, well, what is outdoor adventure? How, how do we define this? And I think it's something really important to, to, to share early to, to tell you what it is and what it's not. Well, what it is, I mean, it's, it's outdoors. It's obviously getting people outdoors, engaging them with nature. Um, it's experiences that are, that are unusual or more alternative. They can be programmed and non-programmed, um, but also kind of emerging sports. You'll see a lot of ideas around that tonight. Um, they're exciting, they're experiential. Um, meaning they're, they're kind of immersive and it really requires a heightened level of awareness and kind of attention in, in doing many of these things. They're progressively challenging, um, entry level to advanced. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, the, the idea of kind of focus and attention and many of, the, many of these in Denver are regional and that, you know, it's really about the Colorado experience. We are so lucky to have mountains and we are lucky to have the city. And so bringing these together is one. But you know, the other important piece is what outdoor adventure is not. Um, and it is not, we are, you know, in this plan, we are not gonna be talking about team sports, things like playgrounds, um, traditional recreation, like courts and, and pickleball courts, those will not be included in this plan. Aquatics and pools, recreation centers, um, that, that's not what we're focusing on. You'll, you'll see the ideas we're focusing on as, as we go through. And we've, we, as we've been thinking about this, there's really kind of three buckets or three different types of outdoor adventure activities. And there are those that are on the land where you have two feet on the land or you know, maybe your, your, your bike tire or a horse's foot on the land. Those that are, are in the water and those are, um, that are on snow or ice. And so as we think about the land activities, um, th there are a lot of them. This is definitely the biggest category. Um, we have everything from hiking and trail running. Um, biking is a big one from mountain biking, soft trails, hard trails, road biking, all the above, um, rock climbing and bouldering, longboarding, skateboarding. We have camping and backpacking, um, equestrian and horse trails, micro mobility um, and wheels, parkour and ninja warrior activities. Um, we also have other things like orienteering and geocaching, you know, exploring the outdoors and, and finding things, challenge courses, rollerblading and skating, um, even archery and paintball. We have things like disc golf and slackline, um, and then certainly things like bird watching or studying plants and animals, tree climbing. We all we think about all of these as kind of land activities um, and outdoor adventures. We have looked and, and analyzed where do the where are these activities happening today um, within the urban context of Denver? You know, so this obviously is not looking at the mountain parks in, in the map specifically, but 
um, within the city of Denver. And you can see here um, the, the parks and the locations that they these activities are in green. Um, and then that kind of orange and yellow color around it, it's, it's about a 10 minute walk or roll around those activities. Um, and then you can see in the, um, the red hatch that again, that equity overlay that we've constantly been thinking about. So looking at kind of how these are dispersed throughout um, Denver and where they're located. Um, and, you know, they, they're they everything from bike skills courses and pump tracks to diff, disc golf, slack line, um, hiking and biking um, experiences. And in the mountain parks, as we know, they're a lot more. These are the those that, um, that are probably um, has the greatest coverage um, within Denver and you'll see how water and snow are a little bit different. Um, and, and the barriers here to actually engaging in these types of activities tend to be um, less, you know, less expensive, I think, to, to engage in many of these activities um, and, and maybe closer by. So we'd love to hear from you guys tonight and, and out of these land-based activities, um, which ones have you participated in over the last 12 months? So um, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen here in, in a second, but which land-based outdoor activities and alternative sports have you participated in over the past 12 months? So again, just kind of a reminder of what these are, um, you can see up on your screen, but the, the answers in, in the live polling. So we, we have hiking and trail running, biking, rock climbing and bouldering. We have longboarding, skating, rollerblading, camping and backpacking, um, equestrian and horse trails, horse packing, parkour, ninja warrior, challenge courses. So that's ropes courses and zip lines, um, disc golf, and then other. So if you see some that are on the screen or maybe that aren't even on the screen um, that, that you've engaged with in the past 12 months, please add it into chat. We'd love to hear um, what you've been doing. Awesome, and I'll give it a few more seconds. We've got about 70% participated. So we've got 80 people attending right now. So if we can get a few more of you to respond. And on this one, I believe you are able to answer, um, it's multiple choice, you can, you can select all um, that, that, that you've engaged in. So if you've done hiking and trail running and rock climbing, you can choose both of them. Um, and just reading some of the comments, we will be getting to water-based sports soon. So this is really just focusing, focusing on land-based. All right, and it's slowing down. So I'm gonna hit end in three seconds. <laughs> Get your last vote in. Okay, ending poll and sharing the results. Great, thanks, Laura. So a lot, I think that the highest response here it looks like is, is hiking and trail running. 81% um, of you guys have, have engaged in that. Biking, um, not far behind at 67%. Camping and backpacking at 55. So 55% 55 of you guys have done that. So a lot of, lot of campers on the call tonight. Rock climbing, longboarding, skating, each about 25%, so a good spread across. Um, anything in chat that, that you guys want to mention that maybe uh, was a surprise? Not a surprise, but I just want to shout out to the mushroom hunting and the geocachers. The, those are good examples. Yeah, that's great. And one thing, if you did not see a poll, you might have a pop-up blocker or something that's keeping it, but don't worry, we have this in a survey that you'll get later as well. Um, and this is not just about Denver parks, parks that you're participating in these in. We wanna know what people are doing in general. Yeah, we see a lot of skateboarding, Frisbee golf, um, a lot of those as well. Great. Well, thanks everyone. So now that you understand kind of more about what, what these land-based activities are, the, the next question for you guys is which land-based outdoor adventure and alternative sports activities would you be interested in trying for the first time or doing more frequently if money, access, and equipment were not an issue? So trying for the first time or doing more frequently if money, 
access and equipment were not an issue. So I'm going to again um, pull up these the, these images again and get your minds going. Um, we'd love to hear yeah what what you guys would like to do more of. So same options here. We have hiking and trail running, biking, rock climbing and bouldering, longboarding, skating and rollerblading, camping and backpacking, equestrian activities and horse trails, parkour, ninja warrior powered micro mobility, challenge courses, slackline, disc golf, and then of course other, if there's something that you would like to do more of that's not um, one of these options. So you, you can choose um, as many as you would like here. All right, we're at 77 participated or 77% participated. So I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, it is slowing down. Get your last vote in. Okay, I am ending the poll. Oh, people are getting last second votes in. Okay, now I'm ending the poll. There we go. Great. Okay, I think everyone can see it on their screen now. So this is interesting. It's really, really split. There are everyone, you know, between kind of a 30, 40% of about everything. So because we have so many hi hikers and trail runners, that was, that's only at 23% um, people wanting to do more of it. So that's kind of on the lower end where we see a lot more Looks like actually challenge courses is, is the, the and slack line together kind of the the top at 51 percent but biking camping and backpacking equestrian popped up here um anything in chat that was surprising i think i saw somebody say skydiving and there's a lot of archerists archery archery mountaineering which i think is um different than one of the the classifications we currently have yeah, that's a good clarification. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of skateboarding, which we are not surprised. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, let's get into some of these other categories because I think I, I see some, you know, folks that really want more water activities possibly. So let's share some, share some thoughts around that. So, you know, when we think about water activities, we have water sports like wakeboarding, wake surfing, water skiing, fishing um, in, in lakes and in river, rivers. We have boating and paddling, um, you know, with stand up paddle boards, which there's more and more of that today. Um, duckies, kayaks, rafts. Um, we have river surfing, um, which actually happens um, in rivers and on a surfboard. Um, and we have floating on, on river, river tubes. And, you know, we may be, um, We'd love to hear if there's some others that you guys are thinking of, but um, as far as water activities go in Denver, um, obviously around the, the bodies of water, kind of more on the west and the central side of town, um, the, the, the areas around these parks in this location are, are between a kind of a 15 and a 20 minute walk and roll. Um, so you can see kind of where they are um, and again, how that, that overlays with, um, with, with that equity um, index layer. And so in, in the city parks, we have some boating and fishing happening. Um, there's also a lot on the South Platte between other tubing, river surfing, um, and, and fishing um, activities as well. But here, you know, with water activities, we do see more barriers with equipment expense, transportation, right? They're, they're um, a little bit harder to get to because of the location being around water um, and, and the safety aspect um, as well. So the question for you all um, is which water-based outdoor adventure and alternative sports activities have you participated in in the last 12 months? So you can kind of see our trends here. We'll ask you about what you want to do, but please here share with us what you have done in the last 12 months. Um, so that should have popped up on your screen. Um, and again, here, if there is um, an, an other, something else that you've done, please put that in chat. We'd love to hear it. So we have um, the same options that I just mentioned, but I'll go over them again. We have water sports, fishing, boating and paddling, river surfing and floating. 
So you can answer um, multiple here as well. Okay, 61% have participated. Get your votes in. And if you haven't done any, that's okay too. You can that's let true. us know in chat. Yeah. Um, and it has slowed down. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. You have a vote. You have one second. Okay. Ending poll. Here we go. All right. Thanks, Laura. So um, no real surprise here. I think boating and paddling clearly uh, came to the top at 83%. But it's great to see we've got a few uh, river surfers out there. I'd love, I, you know, I, I love that. It looks like about five people or so. So, but we've got water sports. 46% um, of you said fishing, 28% um, at floating. So. A lot of comments about lake swimming or swimming in general or paddle boarding, which I would uh, somehow equate with swimming, but um, I would also equate that with water quality. And so I think that's something that we need to think about as we move forward with this plan. But there are, there's a lot of swimming in these um, in these comments. Great. That, that's a good one and, and one we didn't you know, have as one of those categories. So thanks for sharing and thanks for putting that in chat. Um, so looking kind of ahead and, and which water-based activities would you be interested in trying for the first time or doing more frequently if money, access, and equipment were not an issue? So again, we have water sports, fishing, boating and paddling, river surfing, and floating. And then if there's something else, again, add to the chat. Awesome. We're at, oh, sorry, we're at 72% participated. It's really exciting watching the bars all move when you guys are responding to this. Um, so it is slowing down a little bit. I'll give you about three, five more seconds. Okay. I'm gonna end poll. Great, thanks, Laura. So again, kind of like the last one, it's you know more split. I mean, but boating and paddling clearly comes to the top. Sixty-five percent of you say you want want to do it for the first time or more frequently. Um, we've got floating and water sports, kind of almost equal at about 45, 47 percent, and then and then fishing. And 32 percent of you guys want to try river surfing. I got to admit, I've never done river surfing either, so I think I would select that. All right, now for the snow activities. So, um, you know, we, we've got a variety in Colorado. We're so fortunate to have all these. We've got skiing and snowboarding and cross country skiing, snowshoeing, snow tubing, sledding hills, ice skating, and ice fishing. Um, and so we've looked at to see, you know, wh where do those, hap th those happen in Denver? And obviously, this is not looking at the mountain parks or any kind of the programs. Um, within the mountains, <clears throat> but we do have some ice skating and, and then obviously Ruby Hill Rail Yard, which many of you are probably familiar with um, in, in Denver that, that happen and provide those opportunities. You know, in the mountain parks, there's cross country, uh, snowshoeing, skiing, snowboarding, ice fishing, um, and then uh, yeah, the, the winter park partnerships that I that I mentioned with the youth programs. But we, we do know that the snow activities do have um, some greater barriers um, in the equipment expense, transportation's um, a, a big one as well. So same questions here, but which snow and ice based outdoor adventure and alternative sports activities have you participated in in the last last 12 months? So thinking about the last year, I know we, we, we know it's been a little bit of a different one, but um, I'm sure many of you guys have done done a lot of uh, snow and ice activities on on the poll that popped up. We have cross country skiing, snowshoeing, snow tubing sledding hills, ice skating, skiing or snowboarding, and ice fishing. 
Um, and again, you know, use the chat if there is another activity you've done um, or if you haven't done any, that's okay. So we'll give you guys just a few more seconds here as the responses come in. Yeah, it has slowed down a bit. It's at 67% participated. So if you have an answer, go ahead and submit it now. I'm gonna end in one second. Okay, and ending the poll. Great, and so no, and no big surprise here, skiing or snowboarding to the, came to the top at 66%, snowshoeing and sledding uh, second and third. So thanks guys. And so now, oh, those are the pictures. So now let's go to the, the, the last question related to these activities and which snow and ice activities would you be interested in trying for the first time or doing more frequently if money, access and equipment were not an issue? Cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, snow tubing, sledding hills, ice skating, skiing or snowboarding, and ice fishing. So what would you do more of? And again, this kind of takes, if, if you assume there's kind of no barriers, you can get there and, and the, the equipment and all those things were not an issue, what would you like to do more of? So we'll give you a few more seconds on this. All right, we're almost at 80% participated for this one. So we've got 66 people that have submitted. I'm gonna close it in two seconds. All right, ending the poll. So again, another, another pretty split one. I mean, people want um, more, you know, skiing and snowboarding to do it more frequently and snowshoeing. So, but everything else, it seems like folks really are interested in everything, um, all, all, all of these activities. So great to hear. Anything to note on, on chat um, from either of those questions? Yeah, there's a, big. a comment about epic snow sculpture and igloo building. So the concept of making winter forts. It's really fun. That's great. I love that idea. There's also a comment that I see on the chat, but I've also heard a lot throughout the years about um, cross-country skiing on golf courses when they're unused. And so um, I think that people have a desire to do cross-country skiing in Denver Metro instead of having to leave Denver Metro and how we can maybe have that happen, but I see a comment there. Right, yeah, and if you guys have questions, I'm just gonna remind you to go stick the questions in the Q&A box, because we'll come back to them at the end. Um, and then this slide you guys see on your screen, just a kind of an overview when we overlay all those land, water, snow and ice activities together. What does that look like in Denver? Um, and, and you can see a lot more happening kind of on the west side um, and centrally, but um, you know how that uh, overlays with, with the equity piece. Um, is another component that we've been looking at here and how accessible are they? So looking at that kind of 10 and 15 minute walk and roll, um, which is are those kind of orange um, boundaries around the parks. So wanted to share some stuff, great stuff about what DPR is doing um, with, with their programming today and, and the impact that they're really, um, that they have um, for, for Denver, Denver youth and Denver residents. And outdoor recreation as a whole um, is, is pretty unique just within the municipal realm overall and a programming uh, and a program that really is financially accessible. So, you know, many, uh, much of the programming that, that's offered today um, has kind of a, you know, uh, lower cost for entry, um, which is really, really unique um, for cities. And it, it shows because in, in 2019, there were 14,000 participants. Um, you know, there has been an impact from the pandemic, but it is definitely gaining momentum and picking back up. Um, and with the hopes that in 2022, there are 20,000 participants. So there are great things happening um, and that we can continue to build on um, through this plan. There are open enrollment programs as well as group programs, um, and they happen in urban parks, mountain parks, and beyond, you know, in, in Colorado. 
DPR also does a great job partnering with many nonprofits and school groups for this programming um, and, and to support other events. Um, and they also see, uh, they also oversee My Outdoor Colorado Coalition and Westwood and Cole. So a lot of great things happening. Um, and as we think about what are some of the unique activities and facilities, I just want to highlight some here um, that, that you guys probably know about, some of these which you know about. There's a great adaptive programming um, uh, you know, offerings within the system. There's a gear library in West, Westwood with plans for expansion. And so you can see one of the images on the right, just as, as an example of a gear library stocked with gear to do all these outdoor activities. Um, so really great asset for Westwood. Um, there's winter park ski and snowboard programs, the Ruby Hill rail yard that's been very popular, uh, customizable group programming, bike parks and skill courses, uh, mountain park, park outdoor hubs. So this is kind of a, these hubs for, you know, basically activities happening in the mountain parks that also have uh, much of the gear in those locations so that, that you can do all those activities up there. Uh, Sloan's Lake uh, Urban Paddling and, and a variety of youth adventure programs. So as I said, there are so many exciting and great activities and offerings today. Um, so uh, this plan will really build upon that. We have looked to see, you know, within the, the programs that are offered, when do they happen and, you know, all year round or what, what seasons. And so as we look at land and water, you can imagine they're in kind of the spring and summer. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but rock climbing, mountain biking to stand up paddle boarding, fishing, camping and disc golf. Um, the winter has many of the snow activities. Obviously, we can all imagine from skiing and snowboarding to, to Ruby Hill Rail Yard. But then there's the year round events that are shown on the bottom in gray from youth adventure programs, their multi-day Colorado adventures, um, urban team building offerings, environmental education, go co-generation wild programming, and, and the gear library. So a lot happening within DPR. Now Jason's going to share a little bit about some peer cities. Thanks, Marius. I appreciate it. Yes, and and I had I had the, the you know opportunity to research sort of um, what other cities are peer cities that we identified along with the team at Denver, to kind of see what's going on. What are the trends? What are some of the emerging areas? And what's very interesting in reading the chat and the questions, a lot of what the other peer cities are demanding and wanting and doing are a lot of the things that folks are interested in this evening. So I think that's great. So I'm gonna hit on a couple of different slides in a few different areas. But the first one I'm gonna hit on and talk about is peer cities with partnerships. And, and Meredith just highlighted some of the partnerships already and talked about that, which Denver's already doing. But uh, I will tell you that every peer city that we reviewed is experiencing significant growth uh, and demand in outdoor adventure and alternative sports. There's many reasons for that. They cite all sorts of different reasons from pandemic to renewed interest to reconnecting with nature, all sorts of things, but all of them are seeing a growth and not just in usage, but a growth, growth in interest as well. And it's very difficult to keep up with that demand. You know, our resources obviously are limited, but one of the ways that they're doing, uh, doing so is through really cool and new and expanding partnerships. And, and they're delivering services of and programs that otherwise would not be possible without unique partnerships. Um, and the other thing we're seeing is, is, is a number of national movements, if you will, uh, things like cities connecting children to, uh, uh, children to nature. And these are cities across the US that are testing different types of ways to connect children to nature. They're made up of municipal leaders all over the United States. And they're focusing on connecting children to nature and focusing on the benefits of nature and more often on wellness as well as uh, equity. Um, and so with those types of resources that are relatively new, organizations like Denver and many other organizations can pull on what are developed toolkits and sort of standards that are happening all over the nation. And certainly Denver's leading in a lot of ways, but they're sharing these resources to come up with ways for communities to come up solutions to, to meet these demands, but other ways that partnerships are occurring. Uh, critical in the area of specialized outdoor adventure and alternative sports. Uh, most cities, 
uh, you know, in organizations, they just, as I said earlier, can't do it all with the resources that they have. And, and one area that's highlighted here is the city of Seattle, which is one of the peer cities we looked at. Sail, Sandpoint Sailing, and another group called Outdoors for all our partners that work uh, with Seattle to deliver unique experiences, that, uh, especially for adaptive needs that Seattle otherwise could not implement. So really what we're saying here with this, this area of focus is, and there'll be a lot more information in the report, but new uh, and different types of partnerships are occurring all over the US and certainly here in Denver to help, uh, help uh, address the demand and provide new and, and exciting programs. One other area that I wanna briefly highlight for now is, is really specific to just programs in general and what our other cities are doing. Um, it was really interesting for me to learn, by the way, and I wanna share this with you, that as I asked peer cities all over the United States and Edmonton, uh, Canada, uh, about what we were doing in Denver, all of them said they looked up to Denver and they wished they had the brand of Denver. I thought that was very interesting. These peer cities are doing really cool things, just like Denver is doing very cool things. And yet they're saying, we wish we had the brand of Denver. And they were excited to hear and excited to share of the, some of the things that they were doing. Uh, and in some cases, they're, they're building identities really from scratch and having a hard time doing it. But at the same time, because they're building from scratch, doing some innovative things. One terrific, terrific example is an organization called River Sport in Oklahoma City, in downtown Oklahoma City. And it's interesting, several of the comments that talked about access to water in the urban setting or the downtown, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, River Sports in Oklahoma City brings over 600,000 visitors to the downtown and about $24 million in economic impact uh, also in robust partnerships uh, all throughout Oklahoma. And uh, you know what I learned was that initially when folks went down this path of establishing this program, which is essentially water sports on an urban downtown river, uh, and the river really wasn't uh, hardly ever used and frankly was hardly flowing before this happened, before this focus on sports happened. But there was a lot of doubts and in fact, the success and how they went about it was really interesting. So that's just one example of a highly successful program. The other one uh, that I wanted to highlight is West Rock Wave Park. And this one is very interesting. And there's other cable type of wave parks that are exist in Colorado. Uh, but I particularly like this one because of the partnerships with the private sector, as well as multiple different public agencies. And their focus is to get folks on the water uh, through cable, um, automated, if you will, uh, uh, wakeboarding and things along those lines. In those types of sports are typically very, um, you know, considered elite and not really accessible. But the way that they're doing it is they're bringing uh, folks that really would otherwise not have access into the sport, and it's, it's really quite impressive. And then the last one, and there's a picture of it here, is Cuyuna Lakes in Minnesota. It's sort of become the mecca of, of, of BMX and mountain bike opportunities. This is a community that um, was sort of abandoned, from what I learned, uh, with old quarries. And in focusing on outdoor adventure, they've sort of rebranded themselves. And when it was a community that really wasn't utilized or visited, uh, folks are now buying houses there and turning them to what they're calling outdoor recreation outposts, just so they can be closer to the outdoor recreation uh, by focusing, in this case, on BMX and mountain bike trails. Great. Thanks, Jason. So the next area of focus is creating progressive programming to better engage youth, families, and people of all ages and abilities by creating outdoor recreation opportunities for all levels of experience. So as I mentioned before, this is really about having opportunities and kind of options, right, from people that are beginners or kind of more novice to intermediate and, and advanced. Um, and, and this just shows an example of, of what that looks like or what it kind of looks like today for biking and climbing. And so as we think about the novice biker, you know, somebody that's just learning, um, the Montbello Bike Skills course is a great opportunity to, to learn a lot about biking. 
Then moving up to the bike skills course at Ruby Hill Park, and then more advanced, you know, when, once you learn more, uh, the mountain, you know, mountain biking at Red Rocks. So you can see that there are opportunities for different skills and different abilities within the system. Um, and, the, and it's a really important piece to constantly kind of challenging people um, within um, what they want to do. Uh, climbing also have, has similar opportunities. Um, we have the, the climbing boulder at Montbello Open Space, the, the climbing wall at Carla Madison Rec Center, um, and then obviously rock climbing up in, in Denver Mountain Parks, and this image specifically is at Genesee Mountain Park. So as we think about this plan and, and are developing our recommendations, we, we're really thinking about breaking learning into these smaller chunks to make skills easier and really meeting people where they are um, related to their skills and abilities. And so I think about it as a spectrum, right? And I gave you a couple steps on the previous slide, but it's everything from the introduction to, to biking and, and excuse me, this, this uh, graphic here is really focused on biking, but you know, layering in things about bike, building your own um, bike and how do you maintain your bike, that, that educational piece, taking group rides and learning how to go on paths within traffic um, to learning how to ride on, on dirt um, in you know, urban parks and, and the urban environment, to pump tracks, to getting up into the mountains and doing introduction to mountain biking um, and advancing into more and more challenging courses. So that idea of the spectrum and having kind of a progressive, you know, a program that really is progressive and meeting people where they are um, is a key component. Jason? You know, and, and thank you, Meredith. And building off of that concept a little bit more about kind of what are peer cities doing about that and what is Denver already doing uh, with that. And, you know, stakeholder engagement, just exactly like we're doing here this evening, uh, and all of those organizations, all those cities, uh, just continues to show the increasing demand for outdoor adventure and alternative sports. Organizations like Denver are trying to find new ways to meet the demand. And they're also trying to find ways to kind of remove the stigma of some of these activities being an elite sort of uh, limited access, if you will, uh, throughout their systems. And you know, some new funding sources certainly are being created because of the demand, and I think in the market is what we're seeing as far as the popularity of these areas. And so folks are trying to be responsive. Certainly there's revenue and other types of opportunities there. But what cities are also doing, much like Denver, by the way, who's doing a great job, they're leveraging their existing resources, uh, such as let's say urban parks, city parks, and they're revisioning those parks around uh, uh, ways to, at the very least, introduce folks in an accessible and local way to different types of activities in this realm. And there's a picture here of Mecklenburg County in North Carolina that is doing that at a really high level. And in their case, in, in this picture, and, and their focus is largely on BMX opportunities locally. But you also have other things, other examples like Bend, Oregon. And I know skate parks was mentioned quite a bit, uh, I think in the chat this evening. And this is an example, Bend, Oregon has a pavilion facility that is uh, very interesting. Uh, in the winter time, it is a, uh, it is an ice facility, so a, sheet, a large sheet of ice, but then outside of the, the winter time, it's converted to an open air roller uh, uh, type of uh, different type of roller activities, roller and wheel activities inside and outside, if you will, into outdoor facility. And it's really, really pretty cool. So folks are really you know, leveraging their existing resources and trying to find uh, new ways to introduce uh, and, and grow uh, alternative sports and outdoor adventures. All right, so um, uh, this is our last focus uh, topic, uh, focus area, uh, and a really critical link here. Um, improve access and transportation between Denver's urban parks and mountain parks to improve the diversity of experiences. Uh, the city has incredible resources between the mountain parks and the, and the city parks. Um, the, the question is how do we facilitate greater access and use of the mountain parks and further complement the activities offered in the, in the city park resources? So the mountain parks, as Leslie mentioned, 14,000 acres, um, contains peaks over 13,000 feet. Um, 22 of those mountain parks have developed amenities. Uh, 24 
of those parks that are, that are also accessible, but they're managed more so for conservation. Um, there are adventure activities that you'll find there, everything from you know, more on the natural kind of wild side of things, hiking, fishing, rock climbing, uh, mountain biking, snow sports, you know, the list goes on. Um, the urban parks within the city limits offer adventure activities as well um, in, in the regional parks, the community parks, neighborhood parks, um, pocket parks, and linear parks. Uh, the, the real question is, how do we strengthen the connection between these two systems and think holistically about the broad range of outdoor adventure activities and um, in that progressive programming that might be possible? Um, and recognizing that some, more of the advanced progressive programs um, might actually exist in the mountain parks. So a key uh, part of that is looking at public transportation. Historically, cars were integral to the mountain park experience. Today, we recognize that access to the mountain parks by public transportation is essential in connecting all people to the parks. Um, there are essentially limited RTD routes uh, that service the mountain parks. You can see on the on the map on the right, um, emanating from downtown Denver, uh, the the primary routes. Um, that transit system is also focused on park and rides, so it's it's so it's very car centric. Um, so the transit stops are not necessarily conveniently um, located so that they're um, convenient uh, for walkability to the mountain park destinations. Uh, and then only four of the mountain parks are readily accessible by public transportation. So there's a significant difference in travel time and experience uh, between the car and via public transportation. Um, so accessing the mountain parks from Denver, um, as an example, uh, imagine you wanna travel from Northeast Park Hill uh, to the East Park in Evergreen um, by car, it's a direct road route. It takes 43 minutes. Uh, by RTD bus, it, you're looking at more of two hours and five minutes. Uh, and within that, um, the, the frequency, it, it, it's more limited and there are multiple modes that one has to take. Um, this, is, this is an issue of convenience, but it's also an issue of equity. If you then take a look at car ownership, BIPOC communities are two times more likely to not own a car. So limited public transportation access disproportionately impacts BIPOC communities. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jason, uh, who will talk about the peer cities again. Thank you. And, and I'm aware there's a couple of questions that came through about some of the things that I reported on. And just here in a second, I'm going to go back and answer them. So I really appreciate the questions and appreciate your patience. Uh, really great work is being done across the country right now, and I think heightened awareness on underrepresented communities, and certainly Denver is one of those communities, and I think the example that was talked about earlier was, uh, one of the examples uh, was the outdoor recreation uh, equipment libraries, which is uh, a really fantastic program to distribu distribute outdoor gear to those in need that otherwise probably would not have access to gear in collaboration with Great Outdoors Colorado. All peer cities in Denver are examining their policies, their procedures, uh, trying to find out what barriers might be in place that uh, need to be reviewed to provide more access, especially to underrepresented communities. Uh, Seattle, uh, using that, their organization again as an example, has done some really cool work around creating some assessment tools for all of their programs and services to make sure they're keeping a close eye as to as they're planning their future, how are they thinking about underrepresented communities and providing more equity in their offerings? Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, peer cities are doing some really cool partnerships, uh, many of which center around underrepresented communities, much like Denver is also doing and pursuing to expand. Um, but peer cities are also expanding scholarships, uh, looking at funding models to help provide even more access to cost prohibitive, prohibitive type of activities. Um, they are uh, doing things like leveraging outside funding and grants, but they're doing a ton of innovative programs. Uh, they're doing new and innovative programs like the Latinx Explorer Club. They're also hiring uh, directly more diversity, equity, inclusion experts 
uh, to help with advice as well as uh, uh, steering the future of program. And I have one more slide, uh, which really kind of summarizes just some of the areas. Oh, and by the way, there was a, a mention earlier about open water swimming. Uh, you look at a city like Austin, who was another peer city, and that's certainly one of their large focus areas. Uh, and so, like I said earlier, a lot of, a lot of the uh, comments, which I think is great, thank you so much for your input, line up pretty well with some of the trends and some of the, the emerging trends that we're seeing across the country. Uh, but it, you know, to kind of recap, uh, I'm not gonna read all of these, but focusing on those tiered adventure activities. So not just providing the most premier opportunities, maybe let's say in Denver mountain parks, which are awesome, but to also provide introductory level opportunities in the urban and local parks to make sure people have access and really start learning about the ways they can enjoy the outdoors. Uh, and I, I kind of liked another, you know, kind of an alternative sport is what's coined in, in one of the peer cities is adult break dancing. I thought that was very interesting. Things like drone racing, but overall a significant increase in water sports. And I, I found that interesting again tonight with the amount of comments that had to do with water uh, based activities. Thanks, Jason. So we just have two final questions for you guys, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A because I know there's a lot of stuff coming in. So um, this question is, if you have not participated, um, sorry, in any of those activities, like any of the activities we talked about early or have had minimal participation, what reason best describes why you haven't participated? Um, so, the answers or the options are they are not near my house. I don't have transportation to get to these types of activities. I don't like these types of activities. I have too many family or work demands. I don't have equipment to participate. I don't know how, how to do the activities I would be interested in. Um, and then of course, if either not applicable or I do, I regularly participate in outdoor adventure um, and then obviously other, if you wanna add it to the chat. So we just wanna get a sense of why um, folks, if you have not participated, um, why you haven't participated, what some of those barriers are. So we'll just give you a, a few more seconds. Yep, we're at 67% participated which is about 46 people and it's increasing a little bit. We've had some drop off. So we have about 67 in the room right now. All right, it is slowing down. Get your last votes in. All right, I'm going to end the poll. And every time I say that, I see another vote come through. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. <laughs> Here we go. Thanks, Laura. So. The top one at 48% is I don't have equipment to participate. Um, and the, that's where these kind of gear libraries and other ideas come in and are, are really important. So that's, that's good to understand. And then, you know, 32% of you guys said they're not near my house um, or I have too many family or work demands, which we know can be a challenging, especially if they're not near your house and you don't have gear. So thank you for, for sharing that one. Um, and then last question for you guys is really what most excites you about participating in outdoor adventure and alternative sports? So now that you know what we're talking about, um, we want to know what most excites you. And I think you can only select one here. So you'll have to choose. Um, the first option is improves my health and or the health of my family. Uh, doing something new and exciting. Taking on a new challenge. Exploring new places that I haven't been um, or other. You can obviously feel free to add it into the chat. So following this, as I mentioned, we'll go into Q&A. So if questions are popping up in your mind, ask them in the Q&A because that is the, that's what we're looking at for um, questions when we open it up. So maybe a few more trickling in and then we'll close it up. Yep. All right, we'll give it three more seconds. All right, just about 50 have participated. I'm going to end the poll.
All right, thanks, Laura. So, um, 26%, but they were all, all this pr pretty uh, spread equally across uh, across all answers, but improves the health um, of me and my family um, at 26%. But really, um, as true Colorado, Coloradans, exploring new places that I haven't been, new challenges and doing something new and exciting. So um, yeah, everyone wants a little bit of, uh, all these ideas excite you in many different ways. So thank you for your feedback um, on all those questions and, and everything. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie um, uh, to, to go through the, the questions and stop sharing my screen for a few minutes. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I just want to do a big shout out and encouragement to everybody to stick in a question into the Q and A. Uh, we've got about uh, you know fifteen minutes or so set aside to do question and answer, so plenty of time to get to a lot of stuff. Jason, the first question is actually coming to you, and it's just a question about: Can you tell us what that thing that was displayed in the picture is called? from Seattle. Yeah, that one's getting a lot of attention. And uh, it's actually, and I have it here, um, and I, sent, I answered and sent the website. It's the, uh, it's just right outside Seattle, but Seattle reported it. And, and Seattle actually has a number of, of camps like Camp Long as an example, but that's not the location of that picture. That picture is called, it's at High Trek Adventures, Seattle's largest zip line and ropes courses. And I did type in the answer of the website if you're interested, but High Trek Adventures. Fantastic. And then Carrie, I'm coming to you next. And it's all about partnership specifically to increase equity and access and climbing. Would DPR consider partnering with Project Send It? Absolutely. Yeah, we have a lot of different partners. We don't have any particular climbing partners now. Um, so we definitely could, could chat about it and, and see how we can partner. All right, and then I'm, I'm first gonna come to you, Gordon, with the various different skate park questions that we have. There's a lot of folks that are passionate about the concept of getting more skate parks spread throughout Denver, specifically the south, Southeast was called out. Can you talk to us a little bit about the parks plans for skate parks? Um, yes, we built the largest uh, free urban skate park in the country, uh, but that was 20 years ago. Uh, we have since been building smaller ones uh, as part of some of our projects, um, but they're, they're very small. Um, and we will continue to do that just as kind of places to learn here and there. But I do think we need a better um, uh, geographic spread of, of some decently sized skate parks. And we've had a lot of requests from the Southeast, I, I recall. A number of them over the years so that's in our uh in our capital planning discussions and uh we want to spread them out geographically and uh and so we're in agreement with that all right the next question is how do we help move these activities forward i reached out about helping to create a disc golf course in an existing park but was told there was a new substitution and submission process that they weren't aware of. So Gordon, can you talk about how does somebody from the public make a request or make a suggestion about what could take place in a park, including disc golf? Um, yeah, uh, you know, 311, we, we get all those routed through us. If it's, if it's planning related, um, it does come to us. Um, so we'll reach out to your council person. They're always good advocates for ideas. Uh, but um, disc golf, and particularly, we've had three or four very serious uh, inquiries about disc golf. I would love to find more places for disc golf. It's a very difficult um, thing to lay out in a park, in an existing park. A lot of our parks tend to be very small. Um, so finding space for it uh, where you're not going to hit someone that's picnicking or doing some other activity with a, with a Frisbee uh, has proven to be a difficult. Uh, but our gulches are good locations. Lakewood Gulch has one now. And we just installed one in our mountain parks, I believe at Newton, if I, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is that wrong? Somebody, Carrie? Carrie will jump Biking in. trails there. Yeah, it's biking. Okay, so not, I, I thought we, okay. But there might be a good location in a mountain park uh, we, could, we could try to explore. Uh, but if you have a good idea, we're open to anywhere in any park, we're open to looking at it. 
Yeah, and, and one of the things the outdoor recreation team has is pop-up disc golf opportunities. So what we're definitely wanting to explore. Deke, in this concept of you know creating more opportunities thread throughout the inverted L and across the city and county of Denver, can you just talk a little bit about adventure sports, adventure biking, and the progression of even skate parks in general? Yeah, definitely. Um, Deke here. We have a couple asphalt pump tracks in the works, which is a good progressive area that you can skateboard on, rollerblade, scooter, and bike. So kind of exploring all the wheeled sports. And then um, as far as progression goes, we have Ruby Hill Bike Park, which has a bunch of progressive items. And then it's just going to keep expanding and we're going to keep building more infrastructure for that. All right. And then this question, it, it's how might plans to activate and have more outdoor recreation opportunities for adventure affect any permitted use of the parks by partnering organizations? Um, Gordon, do you want to take a stab at that? And then I can add to it now. <laughs> can can uh, you restate that or someone else could jump in? Yeah, so if we do partner permits or a public permit within a park, the idea is that those things are in specific locations that aren't a part of the nuance of these outdoor adventure activities. So for example, at Garfield Lake Park, we have that mini mountain bike course. That's not a part of the permitting process within the system. If there's any more questions about that specific, please don't hesitate to stick it in the chat or even just reach out to me directly. And I'm, I'm happy to walk anybody through the process or get you connected to our parks permitting group. I just want to jump in for just a second on that comment, because I think this plan is looking at permitted activities and not permitted activities as well. So we are looking at both. So while the permitting may be affected by this, and we're definitely ha um, having conversations with our permitting team on that, um, we're hoping that it also the plan involves a lot of, um, you know, free, accessible, not permittable activities as well. Awesome, thank you, Molly. And so Carrie, I'm coming to you with this next question, but I think we can add in from Gordon and I as well. Which intergovernmental interagency, public NGOs, public private partnerships has DPR found most valuable in building additional equity into programming and long-term planning? What might the department hope from partners moving forward? Yeah, in our um, realm with outdoor recreation programming and with my limited time uh, with the department, so I've been four years, um, I've been involved heavily with the My Outdoor Colorado coalitions, both in Westwood and Cole. And I think they've been a model for providing programming uh, through partnerships um, and that coalition structure to underserved communities. And we hope to expand that model uh, into more communities and, and add additional partners as we do that. Yeah, and I would uh, yeah. just add that we've, you know, had a partnership with Interwest Winter Park for quite some time. And so that helped us develop Ruby Hill and create the um, course that we have there for learn to ski and ride programming that happens at DPR uh, at Winter Park. So there's a lot of opportunities that we want to explore with corporate partnerships and sponsors. Go ahead, Gordon. I was just going to say that the you know, Great Outdoors Colorado has been a huge uh, friend of ours in this regard. Uh, lots of grants have gone into this area, but um, the more that we reach out to, to interested uh, nonprofit uh, funding sources, the more we're finding they love these kinds of amenities. They tend to be free or low cost, uh, and they tend to attract a lot of people to our parks and get a lot of health outcomes. Um, so we're finding a lot of grantors are interested in these amenities. Um, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a lot. The next question is, what does the master planning process look like in terms of development, approval, funding, and execution? And is there a certain time frame that you expect for these opportunities to come to fruition? Molly, will you jump in and just talk about the timing? Sure, the and I think, plan? Meredith, you have a slide on this, don't you? 
if you don't mind, just like for the master plan purpose, you do, you shared yep. that, didn't you? Do you want me to share the, the process slide? Yeah, if you don't okay. mind, just because I know we threw a lot of information at you and I think it's really helpful um, that this is for, thank you for this particular master plan process. This is kind of where we're at. We're in the inventory and assessment phase. Um, uh, again, a huge piece of this plan is going to be partnership opportunities, um, but then also community engagement, which we're starting tonight um, with you all. So um, we really do hope to have a final plan, and that will just be, you know, a, a plan on paper. Um, uh, early next year, well, mid next year, April. Um, but then what happens is we take all these great ideas and we implement them and we try and implement them and we get the, get some of the ideas budgeted, hopefully in the short term and some will be longer term depending what comes out of the plan. But really um, we hope to get pie in the sky ideas as well as things that I call low hanging fruit um, that are, you know, shovel, Leslie refers to them as shovel ready projects. So we hope that some of the things that come out of this plan will be implemented in the next two to three years. And this is, but this is a 20 year plan. So, um, we also expect some will take a little bit of time. All right. Thank you. Um, This question is going to come to Gordon. So it is about mentioning in the chat a couple of times the concept of fight, fat bike, fat biking. I can't speak. Um, and can you talk about if we would ever consider trail grooming for both fat biking and cross country skiing? Well, I've never heard that one before, um, but I do see the fat bikes everywhere nowadays. Um, so I love the idea. I think the cross country skiing has been around for a while and we need to figure that one out as part of this plan. Uh, and if we have cross country ski tracks, uh, there's no reason why we couldn't you know, have a day where it's devoted to fat biking as well. All right. Gordon, this, this next one is yours as well. So it's given the ballot initiative, what are those funds designated for? Um, and do the voters approve? And what is the fiscal note on the ballot? So can you talk about the parks legacy dollars and how those funds are designated? Yeah, thank you to the citizens of Denver that voted for 2A. Uh, it has transformed our department. It has allowed us to catch up on a lot of capital maintenance and repairs throughout the park system. Hopefully you all have seen it in your neighborhood parks and your community parks. Uh, we have a five-year plan uh, that council approved uh, back in 2019 and we update it every year and get council approval every year uh, for how we're expending those dollars. Uh, one of those uh, ways was to fund this, uh, this initiative today. And my hope is that um, when, when the results of this plan um, come out, that we can really look at diverting more dollars to outdoor recreation. Uh, we do have quite a lot of money going in today. Uh, Ruby Hill uh, phase three, I think, or phase four is under design right now. And that's gonna add some new amenities, uh, bike related amenities. Uh, and we have other things in the works, but with this plan, we'll have a real uh, framework for how, to, how, to, how and where to fund projects. Uh, and 2A will help us do that. And, and again, that's about 37 million a year uh, annually that we didn't have before. All right, Howard, we might have to tag team a bit of this question and just answer portions of it right now. So Howard's asking the question about the possibility of offering grants to privately owned climbing gyms so that they can incorporate youth um, and various different families to participate at a low or no cost. And so Gordon, do we have any history of providing grants to a private entity? I have to give that one some thought. I don't believe we do, but I'll, let me think about it for a second. And then Howard, it's, it's an interesting point. So right now we're collecting all of the information as we said, and trying to work out creating a plan on how we can tackle these private public partnerships 
in terms of getting more of these opportunities to the people. So thank you for it. Um, I wanna pinpoint your second comment, which is most climbing walls are geared towards beginners. There's generally no outlet for those who want to advance to the intermediate and expert level. So Carrie, will you chime in on how we can create some you know, progressive opportunities for climbing? Yeah, right now we do a little bit of progression. We have some programs that start at the Carla Climbing Wall and then progress um, to our outdoor rock climbing sites. Um, but we do recognize there, there is a demand um, for more of that. So we're exploring how we can do um, some more immediate uh, level stuff on the Carla Wall and at our sites that we have. And then um, trying to find additional locations where we can do uh, continue that progression. Okay, Meredith, I think we'll just tackle some of the remaining questions through comments and turn it back over to you. Great, thanks. So let me share my screen one more time. And um, Molly went over this, but just want to kind of share the share again the process, how you guys can in, continue to engage and give feedback as we move through this. So um, we we have been working on the inventory and assessment, um, and obviously we are here at the end of September for our first public meeting. Um, following this, we're going to be taking all the great feedback um, and from the online survey, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, working on uh, partnership opportunities, draft plan recommendations. Um, and then we plan to come back um, to you guys at another public meeting in early or sometime in January, um, work on the final plan development and have a third meeting um, several months later in, in March um, timeframe. The other thing just to note is that, you know, we'll be doing online surveys with each one of these public meetings. We also have a technical advisory committee that's comprised of um, a very diverse group of, of partners um, and, and other uh, folks that are really engaged in outdoor adventure to guide this plan. Um, and so we have met with them once. And as you can see in the, the yellow diamonds there, we'll be meeting with them throughout the, the planning process. Um, as we, uh, following tonight, we are gonna be launching um, an online survey. And so we ask that if you guys can sign up for the DPR updates um, and take the online survey, share it with others. We really wanna get um, you know, feedback from everyone and, and understand um, what, what they participated in in the past and what they're really looking forward to in the future. The, the questions on the survey um, are, are similar, almost the exact same as what you saw tonight. So thank you for coming. You can take the online survey if you would like again, um, but, but share it with others. Um, and we're trying to get engagement from everybody, all ages and all areas of Denver. If you have questions um, and want to follow up, you can email Leslie or Molly. Their emails are on the screen. Um, and obviously watch for updates on denvergov.org slash park projects. And you can scroll down to find um, the Outdoor Adventure and Alternative Sports Master Plan. And Meredith, um, if you don't mind me interrupting, I heard there was a question about the surveys and how we keep demographics equitable and make sure they represent our city. Just know that is something we do keep an eye out for. So we have the survey open the whole month of October, which means we're going to be able to look and see who we're not hearing from. And we're going to make sure that we get ages, demographics, everything as best to represent the city as we can. But we also need you to share that and to make sure that you are sharing that with your community. So we put the link for that survey in the chat, um, as well as the link to sign up for up updates. Sorry for the interruption. No, that's great. Yeah, we definitely monitor the responses coming in and, and to see how reflective the demographics are with the with with the overall city of Denver. And, you know, please share it with kids too. We have um, the online survey has pictures in it, so it should be easy for kids to take too. So we would love to get uh, youth feedback as well. So thank you all for coming tonight um, and, and sharing your feedback. And, and we look forward to, to hearing from you further into the process. Have a great night. And then before I hit end, because I just saw a question, we are sending out the video link in the email tomorrow and we will have it up on our website. So tomorrow afternoon, it should be available for you to share. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. Thank you all so much.
Good night.